Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 431. Written by Pepper Antique. Look at him. Ocean said as she conversed with the others. He meddled too directly in mortal affairs and now his all, incongruous. Oh it's not so BBBAA, Defiant said as he temporarily appeared behind them, causing them to jump, before reappearing in the chair they'd conjured for him. The restraints they'd placed were nowhere to be seen. Okay it might be that bad. He squeaked out in a pain that gods typically didn't experience. Ow. Are you feeling actual pain? One of the others, he thought it might have been love, asked curiously. Defiant stood up and dusted himself off. His arm passed through his torso and he looked at it with studious eyes for a moment. Instead of a hand he now had something akin to a claw made of marble. He shook it and it went back to, normal. You should try it some time. He scoffed as he made to move over to the nearby viewing area. He bumped into the invisible field. They were all maintaining and continued walking in place for a moment before realizing he wasn't going anyway. He stopped, with his hands on his hips, and took a deep breath. But he still lectured them. Give you some perspective. He said. Mortals experience it all the time. You guys only know embarrassment and anger. Plus a few other things not appropriate for the people witnessing all this on their screens right now. The other gods looked at each other curiously at the last sentence, before looking around to see if any of their adherents had made unexpected visits. But they saw nothing. Defiance. Life said, surprising the rest of them. You know that you're not really supposed to be privy to that. Don't hurt their little brains too. Sorry mom. He replied sarcastically. By the way. I've been really good lately. Can I please be let out of the corner? He said with manifested puppy eyes. Death simply shook his head in disapproval from next to her. You are less, disoriented than before. Life commented. How are you feeling? Defiance put away the act and smiled. Like a mortal with a hangover. He said with odd cheeriness. Your champion is all but faded. War said. His fight nears its end. Defiance looked over his shoulder with a look that was uncharacteristically hostile. He's fine. He spat harshly to the crustacean like armored god. War held up his weaponized claws in a supplicative gesture that the others weren't used to on him. I meant no disrespect. War replied. If anything I am tempted to make him my own champion. He shrugged. Or at least I would if it wouldn't leave me looking like you. HMMPF. Defiance scoffed. You should be so lucky. Then a warm hand placed itself on his shoulder, startling him despite his omniscience. A significantly colder hand rested just above his arm, making itself known without actually touching him. He turned back and beheld the only two he actually respected. This gamble is almost played. Life said. He should rest. The rest of the pantheons watched in silent or at the rare display of closeness. Plus, as much as they knew about what was happening, they still didn't know what was actually going to happen. The story playing out between the two mortal brothers and those around them were oddly obscured to the rest of the gods. He can't. Defiance said softly as he looked up into their eyes. Not yet. Life nodded. I know. She said. You know what it means. Death sent only to him. Defiance nodded. An end. He sent back to both of them. One way or the other. But he didn't mention what he suspected would happen after. Life had her suspicions, he knew. And death knew exactly what his own destiny was regardless of anything that happened until then. They both let go of him, and suddenly the intangible barrier was gone. Off on the other side of the thought space Moon ignored the show. She knew from life and death's involvement that the whole thing was above her station. Instead her attention was drawn to the two parties of folk that were about to converge on earth. There was about to be a clash of faith there. One entirely focused on her and her role in the lives of her children. And she was curious to see how that would go. At approximately 0900 hours on October 14th, at least according to earth's calendar anyways, 
James cut the ribbon for the first and only embassy any nation had ever set on a completely different world. It wasn't a large ceremony. Really the only people attending were the earth personnel, who all wore their duty uniforms, the king and his present family, the small party from the Lunar Council and a decent number of the castle staff. Civilians from the city watched from nearby as well, but they mostly did so out of curiosity more than anything else. The concept of cutting a ribbon to open a new building was foreign to them, though many of them admitted that it was a nice event. A small number of the Earth soldiers, being led by Driscoll, actually handed out snacks and drinks that had been prepared in the embassy itself. They were mostly just sandwiches and cookies, with tea and coffee. But it was simply meant to show that the building and its staff could be self-sufficient. James's first duty as the official military commander of the embassy was to be promoted. Lieutenant Greaves read off the attention to orders promoting him to major. Amina pinned the new insignia on his chest while he held the two twins. He had to suppress a grimace as she punched the pins into his chest almost hard enough to send him flying. He only stayed rooted because she'd winked at him just before she punched them in. He didn't miss the way Vickers chuckled at that. Then he immediately turned around and promoted Greaves, Green, who was now officially a first sergeant and not just an acting first sergeant, Vickers, and several others. He even officially, with the king's approval, removed the enchanted ankle shackles from the remaining soldiers who were still wearing them. These included Driscoll, Five, and even Sergeant Nguyen. He made sure to return the favor to Vickers as he punched the pins into the new MCPO. Unlike his own pinning, Vickers barely acknowledged the impact. James made a mental note to ensure that for Vickers' next promotion his pins were coated in silver. His final official act of the day was to oversee the signing of an official SOFA act between the King and the United States. This allowed the soldiers and Earth civilians present, so long as they were in good standing with both nations, to be released into the public at their chain of command's discretion. This was explained to the castle's present soldiers and the civilians watching. They were told to take note of the uniforms and plain clothes of the Earth citizens so that they could know who they were interacting with. He also informed them of the tensions between their peoples, and that while the earthlings were welcomed in his country, they were by no means immune to the law or the rights of the land and its people. It was a veiled warning that James didn't need to be warned of, and he had already explained it to his people just in case they didn't know how to read the lines. Then, when the king was done with his speech, James turned to the people under his command. Official embassy duties begin at 0500 tomorrow morning. He yelled at them. Those of you on guard duty or other round-the-clock duties know where you need to be and when. For the rest of you, he nodded at them and then looked over at the king, who nodded back. Fall out. Then James walked over to Amina and took Kelsey from her as he wrapped an arm around her waist and they made their way over to where the snack bar was. Nobody had warned him of how being the guy in charge meant not getting to partake in the snacks until the show was over, and he was starving. 